Hello, welcome to this video vlog on emerging concepts and clinical strategies in Merkel cell carcinoma. I'm Dr. Paul Neum. I'm a professor at University of Washington in dermatology and also at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center and the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. Today, I would like to share with you a few key points about what's happening in Merkel cell carcinoma. And generally speaking, I'm really pleased to be able to tell you, I think you probably already know, a lot is happening in Merkel cell carcinoma after a very sleepy decade or two in which uh, we got a little better at treating aspects of it, but we never really could touch how we manage metastatic disease. We are now happily in a very different position in which we can help a lot of patients who do develop uh, even metastatic disease. So, a word about the key clinical features and diagnosis of this cancer. Unfortunately, unlike melanoma, Merkel cell carcinoma is typically very bland looking and it's difficult, even for a dermatologist who's quite familiar with looking at skin and looking at skin cancers in particular, to recognize a Merkel cell carcinoma as compared to a folliculitis or a cyst or uh, perhaps another non-melanoma skin cancer. Uh, it isn't brown, it's not got those uh, scary looking features, and on the day of diagnosis, two-thirds of doctors who did the biopsy of a Merkel cell carcinoma thought they were sampling something that was benign. And typically patients are the ones that force their doctor to get a biopsy because they know that this is not like something else on their body. These are typically non-tender and that's the outlier. Otherwise, it might look like a inflamed cyst or something like that, but they're non-tender and uh, often rapidly growing. And you really cannot know that you're dealing with a Merkel cell carcinoma until the biopsy is done. Uh, once under the microscope, it's quite straightforward. There are uh, relatively recent, uh, 20 years ago, uh, newer uh, approaches to do immunohistochemistry in this cancer, and that makes it quite straightforward to diagnose with cytokeratin 20 and other immunohistochemical markers. So the trick, the challenge, is getting that first biopsy done. After that, it's usually pretty straightforward to say this is a Merkel cell carcinoma. Then the big challenge is how do you manage it? And if you, go to, if you go to just a straightforward local doctor, they are likely not to be very familiar with this cancer and they'll need to at least refer to materials that are updated or send the patient to a center that focuses on more rare diseases like this. Broadly speaking though, among people who do treat Merkel cell carcinoma often, the standard of care hasn't changed greatly in terms of surgery and radiation over the last 10 or 15 years. This cancer is much more likely to need radiation than is a melanoma or a basal or squamous cell carcinoma because it tends to jump beyond the surgical excision sites by often several centimeters. And unless the patient has a truly low risk tumor, often adding adjuvant radiation will help decrease the risk that the cancer will come back in that area or in the draining lymph nodes. And of course, considering a sentinel lymph node biopsy is important to do. It doesn't always make sense to do it, but it should be considered in virtually all cases because even with small Merkel cell carcinomas, there's a often 15 or 20% risk that it has spread in an occult manner to the adjacent draining uh, lymph nodes. And uh, it is much more likely to do that than a melanoma. So that needs to be taken into consideration. On the other hand, the role of systemic therapy as, compa as compared to regional surgical and radiation has been massively uh, improved and uh, modified in the past few years. Until one year ago, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines listed nothing for systemic therapy besides chemotherapy. Of course, many flavors of chemotherapy were listed, but it was all different flavors of cytotoxic chemotherapy. Happily, as of one year ago, pembrolizumab was initially listed as an option, and we anticipate that because of the new data, avelumab and nivolumab will be added to national guidelines uh, very soon. The role for chemotherapy still exists, but it really now is relegated to patients who do not qualify or it's not appropriate to give immunotherapy, such as those with profound immune suppression or those who have solid organ transplants like of the heart or the liver, such that if they lost them, then uh, they would die. 
Renal allograft patients sometimes can get immune stimulating therapy. Uh, but other than those situations and patients in whom uh, immune therapy has failed, chemotherapy is really not given in the first line anymore. And the reason for that is that while chemotherapy will shrink Merkel cell carcinoma, and the typical chemotherapy regimen is a small cell regimen of carboplatin etoposide, while it will shrink it in almost two-thirds of cases, the period of response is frustratingly short. On average, it's only 90 days from the start of chemotherapy. And once the cancer then comes back, it becomes much more resistant to treatment in the future. So also, another reason for not pushing chemotherapy now is the chance of response after getting chemotherapy to immune therapy, like a checkpoint inhibitor, is markedly decreased. Very broadly speaking, if you've not received any chemotherapy before, the response rates to the immune therapies are around 60% and often durable. For people who've received and failed one line of chemotherapy, that falls to around 40%. And those who have received two or more lines of chemotherapy, the response rate to immune therapy subsequently is only about 20%. So for all those reasons, unless there's a necessity to go with chemotherapy first, immune therapy typically makes sense. So what led the field to believe that this disease was amenable to immunotherapy? Many things pointed in that direction, including the fact that as of 2008, we knew there was a virus that was driving this cancer. And the reason for even searching for that virus was that uh, this cancer was associated with immune suppression. And that, that led Patrick Moore and Yuan Chang to do a deep search for a pathogen, and they found the Merkel cell polyoma virus in 2008, and that has really revolutionized and excited the field uh, and given us a lot of tools for how to track and treat patients. Uh, other things that linked uh, this cancer to a possible immune therapy benefit was the fact that T cells, if they were present in the tumor, uh, CD8 positive T cells present in the tumor, were strongly associated in multiple cohorts of patients with outstanding outcomes. And conversely, patients who are immune suppressed were between 10 and 50 fold more likely to get the cancer and at least about two fold more likely to die from the cancer than those who were immune competent. So a lot of things led us in that direction and perhaps most relevantly and mechanistically, the finding that Merkel cell carcinoma specific T cells, in particular Merkel cell polyoma virus specific T cells that were present in the blood and the tumors of patients were often showing signs of exhaustion, T cell exhaustion with the co-expression of PD-1 and TIM-3 and other markers that indicate that T cells have been working hard for a long time and are running out of fuel and not atta attacking their target as effectively anymore. So all those things made it very appealing to look at this and it was very difficult initially to get pharmaceutical companies interested in this rare orphan disease. Uh, but happily now, uh, multiple companies have become interested and, and really invested in this and looked at it and the results are quite uniform and striking and uh, important for the field and for patients. So some of those studies include uh, of immune checkpoint inhibitors, the very important one of Avelumab, the Javelin 200 trial, which initially started out in that extreme need setting where patients had already failed chemotherapy and there was really no other appropriate reasonable option for those patients. In those folks, by one year, if you, do not give chemo, if you do not give immune therapy and you instead give more chemotherapy, yet another line of chemotherapy, prior to one year in three different cohorts that looked retrospectively at the efficacy of chemotherapy, 100% of patients had relapsed prior to one year after getting chemotherapy for the second or third time. In contrast, of the patients that received Avelumab or uh, or, now, or Bavencio, its other name, an anti-PD-L1 agent, about 30 to 40 percent of them, initially fully 40, but then falling to 30, had persistent benefit at up to and per exceeding one year. And that benefit uh, seems to be lasting. So while we are not 
keeping the cancer from coming back in the majority, a very substantial minority, over a third, are deriving very profound benefit um, for more than a year, and that is a tail on the curve that absolutely does not exist at all for chemotherapy. And I think that's why the FDA gave rapid, accelerated approval to Avelumab in Merkel cell carcinoma <clears throat> uh, now uh, in March of 2017. The pembrolizumab trial was uh, published in, uh, a little bit earlier in the New England Journal. That was given in the first line, which in some ways is how we think these immune therapy agents should be given, as, we're, as, as I mentioned before. And the response rate was correspondingly higher in the first line in the, than in the second line, with about 56% uh, responding. And the vast majority of those responses were persistent for uh, over a year. Uh, then there's a nivolumab trial that has not been published formally in a peer-reviewed journal, but was, was presented uh, at a national meeting, the AACR meeting, in which the response rates were uh, also superb, arguably <clears throat> even better than avelumab or pembrolizumab, and they had that in uh, first line, second line, and third line, and they saw excellent responses in all cases with uh, the data being early, but also suggesting uh, persistent benefits. So we have three different agents that have been looked at and publicly reported on in Merkel cell carcinoma that work to inhibit the PD-1 pathway, whether it's on the PD-1 side or the PDL one side, either uh, seems to work quite well and uh, really provides a qualitatively different type of response than chemotherapy. Interestingly, the response rates are almost identical to chemotherapy. It's all about the durability and somewhat about the toxicity. We believe that immune therapy is somewhat less toxic. It's certainly differently toxic. And uh, uh, you have to watch very carefully for immune-related adverse events. But overall, it's probably better tolerated than chemotherapy. In terms of the clinical use of these agents, uh, I think for all those who are already familiar with using uh, checkpoint inhibitors and other types of cancers, I don't think that there's anything radically different about using these agents in Merkel cell carcinoma. Perhaps the patient population is a little bit older, but fundamentally we are seeing the same kinds of uh, immune-related adverse events and side effects, and they, of course, I don't have to tell anybody who's used to treating patients with these agents, those IRAEs can be incredibly insidious and difficult. So you have to have a very high level of suspicion even for mundane complaints like diarrhea and constipation. In particular, diarrhea we know can be colitis, but we had a recent case of constipation uh, in which that had been caused by a profound destruction, autoimmune, of the nerves uh, controlling the gut. And uh, we didn't suspect that for the first few days anyway. Uh, and you just have to have a very high level of suspicion uh, for rare and the common IRAEs. What is the impact of, uh, this, on the standard of care of, um, of this, uh, these drugs? It's been enormous. As I said, surgery and radiation, the initial management of Merkel cell carcinoma that has not spread beyond lymph nodes probably has not radically changed in the past few years. We're pretty good at managing that and rendering 95% of our patients free of any clinically evident disease using surgery and radiation. But almost half of Merkel cell carcinoma patients will recur. And now when they do recur in places where where they're more distant and more advanced, we have at least reasons for real hope. Uh, about a 50% or better chance of, of real benefit from one of these immune therapy uh, agents targeting PD-1 or PD-L1. We have enormous amounts of work that need to be done to help almost the other half of patients that do not benefit in a persistent way from these agents. And uh, I am optimistic that we will find ways that help, often by targeting the innate immune system and activating it through toll-like receptors, through natural killer cells, uh, through uh, multi-pronged approaches with interferons and with uh, cellular therapies. Uh, this is a particular exciting area of using adoptive T-cell therapy, uh, either uh, autologous uh, T-cells that are grown up from a patient or increasingly transgenic T-cell receptors can be put in and target the viral proteins, and that's going to be an area of interest going forward. 
So there's reasons for lots of hope. It's been a time of uh, incredible progress in the past few years, very exciting, uh, very hopeful for patients, but still about half of patients who get to that advanced stage, we don't have something sort of off the shelf that's going to end up working for them and there's a lot to be done. I do hope that what I've shared with you today will help you in your clinical practice as you treat patients with Merkel cell carcinoma. I encourage you to go online and get updated information uh, from multiple websites that uh, offer quite good quality updated information about uh, how to manage this cancer. Those things are going to be changing rapidly into the future, which is something we're very happy about. Thank you for your attention.